We have a number of common terms and thoughts here in the world that do not really tell the story they're supposed to tell. And as a result of that, we have come to the conclusion, which is quite erroneous, that we are as old morally, mentally, and emotionally as we are physically. That if the physical body begins to get a little decrepit, they become elders. And now we have the term maturity, which is generally attributed to a phys con physical condition of retirement, but actually simply stands for integrity or the adulthood of our minds, emotions, and inner convictions. We term an adult now anyone who is able to vote or drive a car. Actually, this statement is completely erroneous. An adult is a person who lives on the level of a realistic integrity relating to his humanity. We are human beings, and as human beings, we are under universal law. And it is our reaction to universal law that determines the degree of adulthood that we have reached. An adult now is a person who is legally permitted to attend X pictures, who is legally entitled to be an alcoholic and to commit all kinds of misdemeanors which children are not allowed to have. So that today a great many younger people are waiting impatiently until they are old enough to commit a variety of delinquencies. Therefore, an adult to us mostly is a person who can do things that are not proper for a younger person to do, and perhaps is uh, beyond the capacity of the elder person. Somewhere in between, we consider ourselves to have the right to think that we are a, a mature human being. Actually, the term maturity as we use it now is a grand delusion. It has very little to do with value. It has very little to do with the levels upon which human beings function. You know, notice, of course, that mankind has a certain unique place in the physical environment in which we live. Human beings have the power to question, to ask, and for that matter, to rationalize their own existences. Animals do not do this. Animals are completely governed by group intelligences. They do what their kind is supposed to do. And we have outgrown this. We no longer do the things that our kind are, suppo our kinds are supposed to do. We break all the rules because we have will and individuality and personal intellectual. We are not anywhere near mature. If a mature person comes along, they're apt to be crucified. They're apt to be disgraced and dishonored because maturity demands integrity and integrity is in short supply and even shorter demand. We do not really want to grow up. We want to remain in a world of childlikeness or childishness. We want to live in a world where someone else does our thinking for us, where we are protected in every way possible, where we do as little as we can and gain as much as we are allowed to gain from our efforts. We expect to be supervised, we expect to be protected, catered to, and even come under a benevolent care of an invisible deity. We are not ready to stand on our own feet, do our own thinking, and create appropriate codes for personal conduct. As we notice in a great many television programs that are coming through, particularly on Station 28, there are a great many nature studies. Many of these nature studies are most illuminating and inspiring. Most of all, however, they tell us 
that these various creatures live under laws, that these laws were not created by them, and they have absolutely no way of amending them. They simply fulfill the problems of survival and uh, perpetuation. They have within themselves a mysterious code which tells them what to do, and some of the things they do are almost unbelievable. We must almost believe that each of these creatures has a tremendous storehouse of individuality, but this is not the case. The bird that builds the extraordinary nest is following impulses, instincts, and attitudes within itself, peculiar to its kind, and it will seldom violate the laws of its kind. Therefore, we say with Aquinas that there are no such things as sinful animals. There are no plants that are delinquent. All of these forms of life are by nature an inherent pressure to creatures of integrity. They do the job they came to do. They live the way they are supposed to live. And they are all gathered together into groups, types, genera, structures, and systems by which they maintain and perpetuate themselves rather well until mankind comes in and spoils things for them. Today we are also to remember that the individual is no longer under animal controls. He is under the control of his own mind. He has the right to create his own way of life. But this does not give him an excuse for delinquency. Man, because he is capable of knowing what laws are and why they are, and through experience justify their need, because of these elements within himself, the human being is capable of judging and planning a career. If at the time he makes these plans he is very young, then he must depend upon education to give him a basic working outline. Education for the human being is sh should be developed strongly on the, on the principle of responsibilities. He has duties to himself, he has duties to his kind, the humanity of which he is a part. He has, a, has duties to nature around him over which he has a certain uh, domination as a gardener or worker in this particular world. He has responsibilities from the cradle to the grave and these responsibilities he must fit himself for. If he fits himself properly for the responsibilities of living he will have a reasonably constructive and helpful life. He will be respected by others and he will respect himself. If however he loses sight of all the rules which every other creature in the universe must obey and starts out on a solo flight to the satisfaction of his own appetites, he will very soon be in serious trouble. And the more serious the trouble is, the more rapidly it spreads through society. The delinquent individual is not only damaging himself, but he is damaging the entire human race and for that matter is extending into all the other kingdoms of nature in one way or another. Man today is destroying not only his own way of life, but the very planet on which he is living. Now, the universal law also has certain curbs on it. He can go so far and no further can he go, because after he reaches a certain point, his various conducts become autocorrective. The individual either reaches a point where he understands and mends his ways or continues as he was and vanishes from this sphere of activity. We see this around us today. We see it in practically every problem that confronts us. Somewhere along the line, man came to the erroneous conclusion that he could do as he please, pleases. This is simply not true. He must please to do that which is right. And we see this constantly in human relationships. We see it in the relationships of nations. We watch with very grave anxiety 
the results of human ambitions that have been allowed to become maniacal, that have become beyond control. All of these things come back to us in the problem of our own maturity. We start out in life comparatively innocent creatures, but let us not deceive ourselves. Within each innocent creature there are potentials. These potentials have to be developed. Life has to be built and unfolded in a reasonable manner. No two persons in the human kingdom are exactly alike. Each one has a personality. Each one has a degree of growth. Each one, however, possesses the power to estimate what he knows and what he does not know. He has the right to improve himself to a degree at least. He has the right to choose that which is best for himself so far as he knows. This the problem of the selectivity of living is not present in the animal kingdom. It is part of man's peculiar endowment. By this the individual can say to himself, I will be a good businessman, I will be a doctor, a lawyer, I will be a worker, I will do that which my own innate capacities permit me to do. And in order that my capacities may be a little more than that by which I came into the world, we have the idea that I will become educated, that I will learn a trade, that I will study a profession, and that I will do one thing or another to make myself more valuable to society and therefore receive greater recognition from society. These things are personal decisions and these decisions become the basis of growth and the development of our lives. Now every child has to pass through certain stages toward adulthood. This is the body itself building its own way in life. It is the body gradually becoming capable of maintaining the dweller that lives in the body. One Carl Jung calls the person in the body. In other words, before he can settle down to a useful life, the individual has to build a house. This house is primarily his own body. This body is variously conditioned by circumstances. Some have better starts than others. Some have more problems to face than others. But everyone in his own place must try in every way possible to build into life that which is most necessary to an adulthood of usefulness. To fail to do this is to become a failure in nature. And in all kingdoms except the human, failures do not survive long. With us they survive a little longer apparently in the hope of redemption. Actually, the building up of a career and a body to sustain it, these are the labors of growth. These are the things we study for. These are the problems which we face in an effort to understand the world in which we live. For, uh, unfortunately, we are not being given the cooperation we need in most cases. Many families, the parents are completely self-interested or perhaps very tyrannical and demand absolute uh, equality for themselves but nothing for the children. This type of thing does damage the young person. Broken homes, various inconsistencies of economics and social conditions, political upheavals, all of these things interfere with the natural growth of the individual. Strangely enough, the animal kingdoms and the plants also have problems. They are uh, subject to all kinds of natural calamities. They are subject to earthquakes and droughts they are, and tidal waves, cyclones. They are subject to many types of infestations and things of this nature. But the animal kingdom keeps quietly on its way and it does not change its own conduct to make it easier to live under an unnatural condition. The animal knows only one condition, that in which it lives. Therefore it adapts to it, adjusts to it, 
and gradually becomes capable of perpetuating it for its own progeny. With the human being, confusion is a more common problem. The human being, with all of his neighbors and associates, constitutes a unit of individualism that is often dramatic and dangerous. The human being does as he pleases, not as he should. He does not worry or consider the effect of his conduct on other people. He feels that he is intended for certain ends, and these ends he will accomplish at all costs. His favorite ends are wealth, power, and fame. These are the things that he really considers to be the great realities. Animals don't seem to suffer from this peculiar absurdity at all. Uh, they are not particularly interested in wealth except to put a few ch uh, chestnuts away for the winter. The, grand, the great careerism which has dominated humanity from the beginning and has given us nearly 8,000 wars in the records of history. This type of thing is unknown outside of our own kingdom. And it is one of the reasons why our kingdom is always staggering along under a tremendous adversity of one kind or another. Now, how are we going to estimate the problem? How are we going to decide what the individual should be and what he should do? Now, to try to face this problem is immediately to bring down upon one's head the wrath of his neighbors. Each person is convinced that everyone else should do what he wants them to do. To differ from him is a mistake. To differ loudly and clearly is anarchy. The, each person has a unique correctness in his own thinking. This correctness has nothing to do, actually, with the study of his own inner life. It is simply the de decision and determination to accomplish the goals which he has set for himself. The worst part of it all is that most of these goals have to be temporary. The human being's ambitions are very illusional. His career is an illusion because he can only maintain it for a comparatively short time. So we begin to say what is the difference between maturity and what we might call growing up. Maturity must be building in something that survives the vicissitudes of age. Age and maturity are not synonymous terms. The elder is not mature. The elder is simply older in years. But he does not necessarily represent a person of greater personal maturity. Maturity, therefore, demands an individual taking hold of his own life and making it significant. Significant of things which are the best that he knows. The other kingdoms have no best and no worst because they do not know. Man, however, can create his own kind of life. He can create his own kind of civilization, his own kind of empire. He has the right gradually to change things according to his heart's desire. But while he is doing all this, he must realize that he is doing these things under a vast canopy of inevitables. The things that he does that he should not do will not succeed. The things that he neglects to do that should he should do are the things that might have succeeded. Little by little, the human being is breaking away from the rulership of the laws of existence. He is breaking these laws largely for the gratification of ambition and appetite. And the more he does this and the more consistently he continues it, the more miserable he becomes. So I think Confucius, perhaps, and Lao Tse and Mencius were very wise in certain things. Namely, that the beginning of a good life probably is to realize that we come into this world only part way along a great evolutionary path. We are not on the summit of eternity. We are somewhere in the lower foothills. We are not now ready for that supreme fulfillment 
uh, that we constantly feel that we're entitled to even though we've done nothing to earn it. We are not actually as wise as we think we are and we are not as prepared for decisions as we believe we are. Most people are quite certain that they are being imposed upon by their doctor, their lawyer, and all these various professions that serve them. But they do not realize that they are imposing upon themselves and that the very traits that they resent in others are in, in themselves also and will be there until they're weeded out. We have to begin to think in terms of what the difference is between human beings and members of lower kingdoms. The members of lower kingdoms live within a universal protection in which the fact that they are small children, in a sense, permits them to receive continual guidance from a power that is never able to fail because of its innate integrity. Therefore, all these lower kingdoms are small children who must gradually grow up through one degree after another of growth and unfoldment. But this growth and unfoldment is guided, guarded, and protected by laws which these creatures cannot break and which they have no instinct to break. There is no particular ambition in an animal except to protect the small area uh, which is its field of activity. It has to protect its own region its own family, because in so doing, he protects the continuation of his own particular lifeline. This problem of territory has been gradually unfolded in the case of humanity until the world becomes a territory and is at the disposal of anyone who can conquer it. Therefore, to us, territory is not to protect our own, but to fulfill our ambitions, aggra aggravate our various emotions, and develop great financial resources. We take territory to enslave it. The animal takes no such attitude. He uses the natural resources as they are. He only sets aside for himself that which is sufficient for the needs of his own immediate brood. Thus, there is a great difference in these points. Animals, and birds, and fish, and flowers, uh, trees, all have strange integrities because they are fulfilling the purpose for which they were fashioned. This brings us to the question that man alone tries to answer. What is the purpose for which we were created? Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to span these years that make up our physical embodiment? We look around us and we hold, we hold something that should temper us but does not. And that is, of all creatures, we are the only ones that know we are impermanent. Other creatures have no realization of the future. They only have the case, the case of survival until something destroys them. And in the animal kingdom, the very young and the very old uh, have to pay the penalties of inevitables. But the human being has now developed an attitude that is quite different from this. He is also under the same laws. He cannot survive, but he is going to change what he does while he is here and make it serve him to the fulfillment of every ambition and appetite that he can cause to arise within himself. Therefore, the human being is not trying to be mature. He is trying to be old enough to make mistakes. And with some exceptions, he does pretty well at it. He does make many, many mistakes. But the problem of trying to outgrow the mistakes is the problem of growing up. We have to gradually learn from the things that happen to us. We have to learn from experience, which the animal cannot do. He learns entirely by instinct, but not by conscious experience. With us, we have the right to perform a variety of actions 
measure the results and, comp and create a, a pattern suitable for the extension of our own probabilities. We have the right to plan a future that will give us the greatest security, the greatest growth, the greatest unfoldment of our own internal potential, and enable us to make the greatest possible donation to the common good. Now these are about all the things that are worthwhile doing, and yet these are not the things that the average person is doing. Now this problem of responsibility does not interfere with personal happiness or well-being. Man is capable of being happy. It's very unlikely that animals have any great sense of unhappiness or happiness. Some of them probably have a contentment when they are able to have sufficient food and their little families and broods are in good order. Man, however, has a capacity not only to organize his life, but to be happy in many of the things that he can do. But he must also measure a happiness. What does it take to make him happy? If happiness demands that he injures others, then he is in serious trouble. If happiness means that he must waste his own potential and lose health and mental and emotional integrities, then he is wrong. Uh, happiness has to arise from order, from things being done correctly in their own way, purposes being fulfilled, and the individual rejoicing in his adherence to those principles which are sound and proper. So we have now this little difficulty that comes along in our affairs. The problem of trying to see what we can do to get some of these mistakes corrected before they become too dangerous. Now there is hardly any person, for instance today, that doesn't realize the dangers of alcoholism. He knows these things. He also realizes that he reads in the papers now almost every day warnings against cigarette smoking. Now, animals don't have any such warnings because, of course, they don't do these things. But man having done them and having the warning makes a decision. If he decides that his own pleasure is more important than the warning and the risks he takes are more than justified by the results of, of his own achievements, then he will probably keep on making these mistakes. And then one day, the ax falls. Something happens that he cannot any longer avoid or evade, and he discovers that he has wasted a life. Now, how can we assume a mature people to maintain institutions, organizations, procedures, policies, attitudes, and systems that they know are not right. There again, there has to be a compromise because the person is firmly of the belief that what he is doing is affording him immediate comfort, immediate success, immediate happiness, and immediate personal satisfaction. Therefore, the immediate takes precedent over the eminent. That which is now is the only thing uh, that becomes important. If he can be happy or think he is happy, now he has fulfilled life. No way can this be regarded as a symbol of maturity. The individual may be well along in years, maybe with white hair and a uh, long beard, but if he is not thinking, if he is not working to do something of value to himself and others, he is not growing more mature, he is simply becoming gradually older and more infirm. And the most infirm person can be the one in a hundred percent good health, but with nothing inside but a vast ignorance. The individual does not become mature because he copies the delinquencies of older people. He is not developing any values if things which are not valuable amuse and entertain him and to satisfy his life. This doesn't mean he has to go around with a long face, nor does he have to wander about in a state of constant overwhelmed responsibility. These are not the problems. But he must, to be truly happy, be useful, constructive, 
and enjoy as much good health as possible. The moment health begins to deteriorate, happiness vanishes also. And most people who have achieved certain physical success, if health fails, find that they are very, very poor. So it becomes necessary for people, each person to prepare a concept of maturity. Well, we can say for one thing that maturity is the ability to live one's life constructively. It is the right to be right. It is the right to do those things which are the greatest good to all concerned. Maturity is thoughtfulness, discrimination, integrity. Maturity is to outgrow the fallacies of life and correct the improprieties of life. Maturity is the person using his inner potential for the greater good of all concerned. Maturity must be the release of internal constructive potential. Without this, the body is a hindrance and a pain. The body is useful only because it enables us to do the things that the mind and emotions feel that we should do. And if the mind and emotions are immature, the body will soon show signs of deterioration through dissipation. So we have to try to find out now what constitutes a good mature person. Well, I think we find maturity in many of the great teachers of the world. I think we find maturity in Confucius, who was one of the first to declare the values of life as far as the Eastern world is concerned. Confucius makes it very simple, very direct, that we are all here to help each other. And maturity is to achieve a distinguished reputation for collective contribution to good. A mature family is one in which the principles are clearly enunciated. A mature family is where the parents respect each other and the children respect the parents. A mature family is one in which there is religion, dedication to principles, and most of all, a keeping of all those rules and, com and commandments by which society remains secure. The good family, the mature family, will never contribute to delinquency, nor deliver, contribute to crime. Of course, according to Confucius, the formalities, the proprieties, were the basis of maturity. Maturity is an expression of gratitude, it is the individual meeting his personal responsibilities not because he has to, but because he recognizes that they are right. Maturity is the person contributing to the needs of others whenever necessary. And also maturity is the inner conviction which enables a person to sacrifice his own life if necessary for the security of something more important. Maturity, therefore, is a grown-up person and the way you can tell them, usually, is not because they walk around like the Chinese Manchus in high boots. The, the proof of it is their relationships with life. What they do, what they think, what they say, what they believe. Maturity is therefore many things. Maturity is thank you for a service rendered. Maturity is a reward for good done. Maturity is respect for authority, expect a respect for, le for age. Maturity is a parental attitude to youth wherever it may be. Uh, the mature person worships deity through kindness, gentleness, integrity. And maturity also often brings with it an appreciation for the arts, music, literature, all kinds of refined things. The mature person rules his own family wisely and lovingly. And each of the members of the family respects the others and also respects the potential within themselves which must be developed if the person is to become a mature individual. So Confucius put maturity as something to us would be almost perfection, something beyond anything we can really appreciate. But it's not true at all. Maturity is simply the individual reacting to his own internal endowments. 
Maturity is the use of the mind constructively, the use of the emotions constructively, and the care of the body with discipline or at least with consideration. Therefore, a mature person does not make common mistakes. They do not have bad dispositions. They are not confirmed warriors. They are not jealous of each other. They are not uh, contentious in their attitudes. They do not create riots. They are not given to crime. They do not attempt to take what they have not earned. And when they work, they do an honest day's work. These things make maturity. Maturity has nothing to do with wealth. It has nothing to do with physical office. It really has nothing to do primarily with years because maturity can extend over a long period of time. Maturity does not necessarily fade out with age either. The individual who is basically mature, who has not merely blocked his mistakes, but has outgrown them, will even in the closing years of life have the gentility, the thoughtfulness, the kindness, and the sincerity appropriate to his in internal achievements. Now, somewhere in this pattern of things, we have the archetype of the human being. And nearly all philosophies and religions have worked on this archetype in one way or another to try to see how it can be turned in the direction most necessary. One of the things that helped a lot in the old days was religion. Religion in old times was a little bit more like the instinct of the animal. Primitive religions were things that were held by a kind of internal recognition. Uh, early religions were never justified by argument and never sustained by elaborate philosophical speculations. Uh, most primitive religions were simply natural human reactions to problems. The need for certain basic values and intent integrities. Uh, well, there was a certain loyalty in primitive religion. There was a certain natural defense of the clan or the brood family. The protection of the weak and kindness to the old and patience with the young. These were natural attributes which were gradually theologized, but which were well established before theologies came into existence. And by degrees, religion changes. Integrities within the individual alter his theological acceptances. He is no longer willing to take certain beliefs that are inconsistent with the higher integrity of himself. If he has really come to realize that he can love all human beings for the, bet, the good that is in them, he can no longer belong to a faith that damns half of them. He can no longer be part of something which is unworthy of his own natural internal growth. Thus, uh, religion is censored by the maturity of the individual, by experiences and by integrities, also by observation and tradition. Another value, as Lord Bacon points out in this matter, is to understand or study the history of the human race. We make a mistake to assume that we have outgrown humanity, that we are now on a high pinnacle of achievement, we are not an outgrowing humanity at the moment. We are one that stands puzzled and uncertain. At crossroads, we do not know which way to turn. Therefore, it is advisable for every person to have a fair understanding of the values which have sustained humanity from the beginning. As we become more aware of how the best have lived, we can gain something about what is the best way to live. And we can do this by study, by contemplation. We can do this by studying in philosophy, in religion, in science, and on all forms of thoughtfulness, so that we have discrimination, that we can take our own partly developed faculties and advance them by study of the common good and all that has gone before. We do not have to start again with the most primitive levels of, eth of ethics or morality. We can gain these knowledges from the experiences of our forebears. We gain them from histories, biographies, even a great deal of poetry and legendary can contribute. 
we gradually come to the point where we are now. We come to the point where we can no longer simply accept the past. We have to do something about it. It's true, of course, that we it may have stopped growing long before we caught up the best of the past. But we have done this and that and what we could and have come to a point of certain decisions within ourselves. We certainly must finally come to the decision that certain things fail inevitably and other things succeed even though it takes longer to bring this success about. Having decided a little bit about this problem of integrities, we can consider, for instance, the religious life of our present time. Every day there is someone comes along with a new revelation of one kind or another. We don't know what to do about it. We have no way of judging whether these people are correct or not. We do not know whether this book is the greatest thing in the modern world or whether it is someone's aberration. We have no way of knowing unless we have a pattern of integrities inside ourselves. If we start on the assumption that we believe everything we hear, we will soon be in trouble. If we reject everything we hear, we may also be in trouble. But without discrimination of our own, we are always in trouble. So where we come to a decision, and we get people every day practically who will phone in or write in and say they have a new volume that's just out that is simply wonderful, and what do we think of it? Well, in the first place, how can we say what we think of it? We haven't read it, probably. But in any event, the point is, they shouldn't be phoning in. If they don't know whether it is good or not, there is something lacking in those instincts which even animals have, the recognition of realities. If they find in a book a various efforts to escape responsibility, if it is filled with promises that cannot be fulfilled, if it is constantly luring the person to further physical securities, advantages, or opulence, then there is every reason to feel that it is simply contributing to the misery of mankind. We must have some basic integrity in ourselves before we can even read a new book safely. We have to have principle. We have to have a, some kind of a firm belief in values or we cannot estimate uh, the values of other people. When we review books or when various people interpret them, uh, this is usually a very unfortunate experience because we do not know the book, we probably do not know the reviewer, and the reviewer himself may not know what he's talking about. The result is a great success economically, but a miserable failure ethically. So we have to have in ourselves certain basic standards that we will not compromise. One of these standards is to avoid anything that promises great rewards for small efforts, to, do, to be rewarded for doing nothing, or to have your various mistakes nullified without self-improvement. These things begin to make problems, and sincere people seek to avoid them. We want to know more of that which is real. We want to know more that will contribute to the enlightenment of ourselves and the improvement of society. We want things that help us to grow, to become mature persons. And maturity never seeks evasions or avoidances. Mature persons never look for shortcuts. They do not believe in rewards they have not earned. And they are very cautious in the development of those extrasensory perceptions which can be so easily distorted and fabricated. So the person himself has to have a certain amount of maturity or he can't go any further. He cannot make the next step unless he knows what he has already accomplished. He must make one step at a time, but he must have stepped from one secure position to another or else he will drift into some kind of a quicksand. The uh, problem then with each person, if he is not yet completely aware of values, he must accept maturity as a natural instinct to learn. 
He must want to know. He mustn't be sitting back complacently believing that he knows more than anyone else. The beginning of maturity is the desire to improve and therefore to use all legitimate means to find out how to improve. And nearly always the best sources of information come from those whose careers and whose achievements over periods of ages have earned the respect, confidence, and belief of mankind. Tremendous importance of the Ten Commandments is a really important discovery. It can take the place of a vast amount of literature. If we want to accept the Sermon on the Mount, or maybe one of the Pauline epistles, and find in it a, a statement of conviction and policy, very simply put in words, most of the great scriptures of the words of the world were written with words of one or two syllables alone. But the integrity is the thing we're looking for. And we generally turn from that to something exciting, or something dramatic, uh, something that stimulates the wrong emotions. All great wisdom quiets emotions. It does not destroy them. It makes them quiet, peaceful, and useful at all periods of life. So the feelings of all kinds contribute to growth. Actually also, in the, the, the search for integrities, we have to realize uh, what most people are now discovering, namely, that where education ends as we know it, true learning begins. We have to recognize that uh, most education as we have it today is equipping us to live in a world which is itself deformed. It is helping us to adjust to something that is not true, not real, and not purposeful. We may have to make certain adjustments in order to survive, but we must never for one moment forget that they are adjustments and not mistake them for legitimate ends. We must realize constantly that we m must try and strive in every way possible to adjust our lives to those principles which endure and which have lasting benefit. And therefore, maturity becomes more or less a symbol of an ability to do things in a, way, in a right way. The mature person is companionable, peaceful, helpful, cooperative, inspiring, and hardworking. The mature person is not deceived by false values, is not a pain hunter, is not a willing to settle down and rejoice in a vast fortune of money, which he does not know what to do with, and will either properly give away, spend, lose, or leave behind. All these false values have to be cleared up. In society today, for example, the world is gradually coming up towards the fifth and sixth billion human beings. This means that little by little, humanity must learn to live with itself. This business of living by preying on itself will not work. Mankind never can be a successful cannibal. Mankind must serve to protect these values about which he, today he is indifferent. For the sake of an immediate profit of a few million dollars, we will destroy that which is necessary for generations to come. We will just depart from all common sense, valuing things only in terms of cash, and gradually destroying the very ground from under our own feet. Now, the, we do this with a good straight face, and we listen carefully to people who advocate it, and we assume that they're normal, mature people. But if a person in 50 or 60th year tells us that we should do a certain thing, this must be given very grave consideration. When in the fact of the matter, so-called maturity as we know it today is simply a very powerful intellectualized self-centeredness. It is something that has no consideration for real value. We are always advising people to do what we would do and when we do what we think we should do, we're sick. So the whole thing doesn't work out. So maturity is something we can't think about at the moment. 
we must not think of ourselves as wise enough, strong enough, or great enough to think our way, plot our way, scheme our way out of the dilemmas we are now in. The only way in which we can solve these problems is to gain greater and greater relationship with our own internal life. Somewhere locked within ourselves is a divine principle which embodies within itself the entire pattern of universal law. The divine law, natural law, and human law are all within the person. They're inside. They're there because they have been brought along down with the very principle of fecundity. We inherit this basic life pattern or we die before birth. And the fact that we can breathe, that we can think, and that we can make mistakes is a proof that there is a power within us in which we have a, an access that is tremendous and universally redemptive. The power inside of the individual is a redemptive power. Power on the outside is usually destructive. But this re inner power cannot function unless the individual stops misrepresenting his own nature. The, the true patterns of maturity must come from a partnership with the laws of existence and not a constant violation of universal law in order to achieve physical gratifications. So inside of the person, as every mystic has known, every esotericist has known, the whole code of nature exists. It is available to us. It is a code higher than that of the animal. It is a code which, however, he reacts to intuit instinctively and we react to intuitively. And intuition is instinct that has been stepped up to a higher level to meet the needs of a creature more highly evolved. So with intuition about things, an intuition which is clear of all ulterior motive, we each of us have within our abilities a true code upon which to build. There is inside of us the very laws that we are seeking on the outside. We have spaceships going off to planets. We are doing all kinds of things to break and split atoms and so forth. But the great scientists, or the great sciences of existence, arise from the intuitive inward recognition of divine purpose. The, purp the individual matures when the reality in himself comes through. He matures not when his mind takes over and makes a despot out of him. He is mature when his soul takes over and makes a liberator out of him. He becomes a great person when the divine greatness moves through him. He remains a tiny person when he tries to be great without enlightenment. So all these things must be all considered in one way or another in order to reach what we might call a grown-up state. And Lord knows we need it now. We cannot keep on being eternal children. If we are going to be children, and there's a way of doing that that is very interesting also, if we're going to be children, we must be ch childlike. This was the secret that Mencius learned from his mother, namely that childlikeness is simplicity. It is faith, it is trust. And as strange as it seems, very often this trust in another also corrects the other person. If some child trusts us, we are going to try to be worthy of that trust. Therefore, childlikeness makes a world in which people are inspired to keep the ideals and beauties and truths of each other. But uh, childhood in the ordinary sense is simply ignorance. Now somewhere between ignorance and wisdom we are existing today. And we are looking around to try to figure out how we're going to legislate out of these problems. We're going to try to figure some way to balance the world's budget. We're going to try some way to get rid of a nuclear armament. But we're doing it all through appealing to the exterior part of the individual. 
We are trying to tell him that he'll kill himself if he doesn't do something about armament. This is true, but it's not the basis of a correction. We are assured that if we don't do certain things, our economy is going to collapse. Well, if we do certain things we're doing now, it will collapse. There's no way of preventing it. All of these outward things have to be moved, directed, inspired, and sustained by inner convictions. The reform that we are looking for must be that, that to realize that every human being that comes into this world have, has a fight on its hands. It must struggle between self-interest and universal good. Every person that comes into this world seemingly is to a measure at least self-centered. They want what they want and they want to live in a world in which their attitudes and beliefs can be fulfilled. But they come into the world without a sense of responsibility. They do not realize that they cannot do certain things without endangering their own survival. Animals don't know this because actually, except for man, their survival is not endangered in their natural state. They will survive because of the fact that they cannot go against law. They have no way to go. They have no mind to tell them what to do that isn't lawful or how to escape the natural ex problems of existence. Man has developed these as additional values. They have been given to him that he might be the creature who, that becomes self-governing, self-ruling, and self-dedicating. It is the hope of the powers of nature that man will become a faithful shepherd in the garden that the Lord has given him. That man will become an instrument for the fulfillment of the divine plan in nature and that he will become the Lord over all animals and creatures, over planets and worlds, but in this rulership will be forever obedient and completely dedicated to the divine purpose. This type of thing we have to work with some way at this time. I think we shall have to get over the idea that we're going to be able to vote these things into existence. Individuals who have never made any effort to change their own nature are voting to have governments change theirs. And yet when someone comes along that might do it, that will interfere with selfishness, they will turn on him. There is no way in which you can correct a human being successfully from the outside. There is no way in which you can free him from the consequences of his own outside actions. But all outsides are governed from the inside. Therefore, the great government, the universal government, the divine government, is communicated through the individual and not to him. It is his own experience rising up. It is the mellowing result of his life and living. It is the inevitable conclusion that comes through the experience and the practice of the various processes of existence. Man can come together, not by having identical attitudes or the same governments or the same arts and sciences, but by the same integrities. For the basic integrities are what create governments, what create laws, create sciences and arts. And where the integrities are wrong, the arts, sciences and governments become corrupt. Therefore, for everything that we need and everything that we desire, there is a proper way of attaining that. There is a way to have peace. There is a way to have security in this world. There is a way to go on doing better things. But the result that we seek has to come from inside ourselves. We have to stop cheating every day. We have to stop all these little deceits. And while that is always very important, there is also the emotional and spiritual relationships of people that uh, are very important. Relationships of integrities, that we admire people for what they are. And when they are doing a good job, we roll up our sleeves and help them. All of the cooperating, cooperating em uh, emergencies that arise can be handled by thoughtful people. Little by little, we can lift the problems of poverty, 
We can list, lift all these different racial and other situations that are dangerous, but only when the one light in all of us is allowed to shine out. We are one life. And why everything we do should be divided so that this life is forever turning on itself in destruction and anger. This is something that human beings themselves must face. Now, education helps, but there's something else beside that. We have to find some way of getting at this internal. For it is this internal which releasing itself or being released brings with it maturity. There is no maturity until the best in us governs the rest of us. Until that day, we are perpetual adolescents. There is no way in which we can solve any problem unless we can be higher in our values than the problem. We must be better than the need or we cannot solve it. We must see more clearly or we cannot cover and uncover the obstructions of life. So we have to work constantly as persons. And uh, why? Uh, how do we do this? Well, one of the things that's doing it is the gradual desperation that is arising in ourselves. We are losing every day faith in the power of external things to solve our problems. We are no longer aware of the probability that a group of people anywhere can take care of the troubles that we're in. It becomes obvious that these troubles arise in ourselves. Crime arises not in society, it arises in persons. Now many of these persons do not recognize crime. They do not know that they are criminals. They only know that they are hating something, or not believing something, or trying to get something dishonestly. They believe in violence, they believe in accumulation without principle. As long as this continues, we will punish them, imprison them, fine them, ostracize them, but nothing will change. The change has to come inside of them just as it has to come inside of us. And when things get so bad that nature can't handle it any other way, these decisions are forced upon us. They are forced by circumstances that we cannot resist. They bring us solutions through a solution only. It must be right. It must be done correctly. And little by little, the individual comes to the inevitable conclusion that it is better to be right and happy than wrong and miserable. And we have only the one choice to make. So in the problem of maturity, I would like to kind of think that the divine in us is something that is so stupendous, so complete, uh, so irrefutable, that if we can just accept it, and how do we come to accept it? I would, I would suspect that one of the ways is to accept it is to look out, see things as they are, and then suddenly realize change is possible. The change is possible and the first step is to correct our own faults. When we see someone else unpleasant or unhappy, we can ask ourselves, how do we feel? When we find someone is unkind, are we strong enough not to return that unkindness? Are we strong enough to keep the simple commandments of Jesus? Are we strong enough to return good for evil? Are we able to do those things which constitute forgiveness? or for the regeneration of our own attitudes. As we become merciful, so we shall have mercy. And when we put our own lives in order, we will begin to be more aware of the divine order. And little by little, the small leaven in the loaf can bring the whole thing to pass. But to be better than we are, we must know that we need to be better. We cannot go along carelessly and indifferently doing what we've always done and wait for paradise. It won't come. But if we can look at each day and see that it's a little better than the former day, it will do a great deal of good. I like the Pythagorean discipline on this. It seems to me that it is very adequate. And that is at the end of the day, look back and figure out what kind of a day you had. 
Think of the things you have done that were good. Think of the things that you have done that were not good. Did you answer the phone call when someone was in trouble? Uh, did you say the kind word? Did you forgive somebody an oversight? Did you lose the tendency to aggravation or difficulty? Did you come, become capable of standing interruption without irritation? Little by little, are you able to gra gradually dominate the negative aspects of your own life? Are you weary from work or weary from objection to work? Are you tired from the things you do or tired from the attitudes you have about them? Work on these things every day with the Pythagorean system and see if at the end of a week or two weeks you can look back at certain corrections you have made. Try to think in each day how it should have been done if you did not do it that way. If you were able to rise above the situation, then you're entitled to a little compliment for yourself. If you fell below the norm, then you should reprove yourself and keep on striving to maintain an internal equilibrium. To be at peace with self is to allow the divine to come through. When we are in its way, when our own opinions come first and universal law gets in the best it can, we'll have troubles. But if we are still, we will know what is right. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and recognize that from within, if we are unselfish and do not have prejudices or conceits, we will be told what to do next and it will be right. And it will usually be a little difficult, but it will be rewarded by a permanent improvement of life and character. We have to recognize that while we are under the government of states and nations, the final government is heaven. We are all children of one divine order. We are all parts of one vast hierarchy or vast race that inhabits space. We are also one people on this little planet. And uh, the largest part of our job is to finally become one happy family here. If we become capable of living together at peace on this earth, we will have had a spiritual achievement and the people of the day when peace is among us all will be able to say that they are mature. Maturity is definitely the ability to face problems without distress, to face situations with kindness and loving thoughtfulness, to overcome all prejudices, to leave behind all contentions, and to realize that we just have a few years here into which to grow and we cannot afford to waste time doing something else. We've got to get to the work that we were intended to do. And if we do that, then we'll have something to be proud of and we will have the ability to meet the face and face the future wisely. Until those times come, we have to keep on recognizing that we're children. And worse than that, we're juvenile delinquents. <laughs> we are doing the things we shouldn't do and trying to glorify them. We are building monuments to the wrong people. We are creating great systems of uh, ambition. We are jealous of things that we should be ashamed of. We believe in values that do not exist. And we are willing to compromise our place in the universal plan to try to improve a situation here that's going to be only a few years at best. Man is also the only creature that we know that knows he isn't permanently here. Animals don't know that. This is probably one of the reasons why they get along better. They are not aware of this. They have no concept of time as we know it. They have life, and then, the, then there is the absence of it. And in the jungle, in a moment, death takes away the life of the animal. Uh, they have life as long as they can defend it. But when they can no longer defend it, they vanish. We have life as long as we can defend it, but we have other ways of assailing it. But most of all, we are creatures that know that everything in this world is transitory. We know beyond question our true orientation in space. 
We know what we do. We know approximately how long we have to do it in. We know why we're here if we do a little thinking. And we certainly know that we have to pass through experiences and then quietly depart. Now, as we have no permanence, everything that we now call ambition and fame is exceedingly transitory. It may be nice to be respected in your own time, but it is not worthwhile to be respected as the dictator does by bringing death to millions of people. We may be a little bit proud of having a successful business, but this does not entitle us to the satisfaction of knowing that we are living well for the good of others. That selfishness, in other words, has no future. Selfishness has, is a mortal thing. Every possession we have is going to leave us. If we possess people, they are going to leave. If we possess things, they will either be taken away or disintegrate of themselves. If we build great careers, we have 15, 20 years of leadership and then obsolescence. We are in the same condition as the Hoover backing machine and the Bristol's rug carpet cleanup. It wears until it wears out and then we have to get another one. Everything that we have is perishable, except that which is the source of ourselves. Down inside of the thing that we know as ourselves is something that is not transitory. It is the life that has descended. It didn't begin with us. It has always been. It's the, word, it's the light of the sun. It's the light of the stars and of space. It is the energy that thrills the atoms. It is one indivisible eternal life. The service of that life is the only thing that is important. And we owe that life everything that we are. And it owes us nothing unless we earn it. Life, therefore, has placed us in the presence of an eternal problem in order that we may master that problem, that we shall become worthy of the heritage, that we shall become good and faithful servants of the divine plan of things. We cannot be good servants if we are ignorant. And we cannot be part of a great divine plan unless we are able to understand it and cooperate with it. We do not ask to understand it all. All we can do is the best we can and offer ourselves cheerfully and unselfishly to the advancements of purposes beyond human understanding. But the whole series, theory upon which modern man moves, this temporariness, this thing that comes and goes, this fact that the uh, ambitions all come to nothing. Why in the world have we been able to continue this age after age and never realize the facts? I think probably the answer is we haven't dared to think about the facts and while we're alive we're going to make the best of it. But this isn't true. We're not even making the best of it while we're here. But that way of life which is going to be eternally valuable is, the, is that way of life which is valuable now if we can cultivate it. The best in us now is the part that is going to serve us forever. We're going out in places where there will not be any cocaine or morphine. We do not have any uh, right to assume that making a fortune out of making other people sick and destroying them is a career. And we're going to have this problem until each individual in his own inner life makes a statement of values and keeps it. When the individual himself says no to temptation, there is no temptation. But as long as compromise for profit, fame, or notoriety is possible, we're going to have delinquency. As long as dissipation is happiness, true happiness is frustrated. So I think we must think of maturity now as outgrowing the smallness of our own life, outgrowing all the childish mistakes that we now regard as careers, and gradually come to realize our eternal citizenship, and that in that eternal citizenship we are somewhere between here and there. We are, we are much more than we were. We must become more than we are. And by growing in spirit and in truth and in love and in understanding, we are gradually going to accomplish the purpose. 
it's, we are going to carry with us into other embodiments in the future good karma the, the continuing reward of right we will discover that the, there is no such a thing as a punishment that makes anybody including God happy a punishment is the result in ourselves of having broken these rules when we stop breaking them karma becomes a glorification of our good deeds we can have a great and wonderful life once in a while we see someone who seems to be having that now and now we may be a little jealous of them we say that they were uh, they were dishonestly privileged in some way but happiness and security must be earned and a life that is dedicated to principles is not a disaster or an, a, an impossible miracle in space a right life well lived is a natural reward of integrities there are honorable people and we can study them also and can find out how and why they lived better lives simply because they had released more internal potential and we have to all understand this and gradually release it as much as we can if we do that we'll be on our way to maturity we will realize that maturity is not the right to be wrong maturity is not the privilege to dissipate maturity is not that the individual is old enough to break the rules of society maturity is not the person who is determined to waste his time doing things that are even below the level of childishness maturity is not the right to watch television eight hours a day maturity is not the privilege to watch violence anywhere maturity is the individual becoming censorship censorship over his own attitudes so that he turns off what he knows is not right without a second of hesitation and if necessary disposes of a whole career if this career is gradually killing him little by little we're going to make some good changes in life and do things that are right and then we'll be mature instead of that it's simply perpetual adolescence it's the individual who will not grow up because he does not want the burdens of right living he wants to do just as he pleases and have a happy life but unless his pleasing is in harmony with the divine purpose he is not going to have a happy life it's up to each person to make a distinct effort to correct in himself those evils which he sees in society around him and which he thinks are endangering the survival of his civilization civilization will go on we will in due time make the corrections but we are doing it the hard way we should be doing these things of our own free will that are being forced upon us by disaster we can change it however but when we begin to do it right things will fall into place and we'll find this much more pleasant world than we ever thought it was we can all grow up and in growing up we do not grow old it is not a sign of maturity that we are aged the most active wonderful and resilient people in the world are those which have, who have maybe reached considerable age and yet are still a living thinking dreaming hoping building and when the time comes to go as one of them said this is the experience I've been waiting for this is the only thing that is left necessary to me to prove the eternity of the plan whatever we go to as Socrates said we go to silence or we go to instruction and whichever it is we are content but we have to earn the right to live well here and to die with a good hope until we do these adjustments and think these things through we have no right to regard ourselves as grown up we are just more or less prodigies infants with prodigious minds in some direction but very short on integrities until this thing is corrected we're going to be in about the same condition we are now and as we don't want to do anything like that we want to get better we might as well start right away and save time and energy well I guess that's it